welcome. Uh, we're here today to just start what we hope will be a very long and beautiful partnership. And so we're excited. We're excited to welcome you to Green Spring. We wish it was in person. I wish we were able to hug each other. Uh, it might be some time before we get to that point. But uh, it, regardless, you know, welcome to Green Spring and especially to the toddler um, program today. So we have a PowerPoint that we're going to get to and uh, a few things to go through today. But mostly this time is for us to, to get to know each other, for us to get to know you and for you to get to know us a little bit. We'll talk about the program. And uh, I think before we get started, though, I want to address probably what's on everybody's mind is what is it going to look like in the fall? This is a, a very, um, it's changing every day. The situation is changing. So what I can tell you is that we are setting our hopes on being on campus in the fall with your children uh, in person. That is our hope, that is our intent, and that is also um, totally up to where we are at that time in the world. And we are, I can tell you, we are deep in the throes of planning. We are in daily conversations with health people, with the um, OCC, with the Office of Child Care, with uh, CDC regulations. We are in webinars, we are in conversation, we are on the phone because the situation is changing literally day by day. So what we knew yesterday uh, was different than what we knew the day before. And so we are deep, deep, deep in planning and our, but our sights are set on being on campus at Green Spring in the fall. And so what we will do is as we learn things and as our plans uh, you know, begin to take uh, more shape, uh, then we will be in touch with everybody to let you know where we are and, and what that looks like. So that's, that's about as much as I can share right now because the truth is we, we don't know. We just expect it's three months from now. Uh, so it's a long time and a lot can change between now and then. And so we are absolutely um, putting our sights on being on campus with your children. Uh, in the fall. So any questions right now about that before we start into our presentation? No? Okay. So Allie, Allie's going to share her screen with us so we can uh, take a look at what's going on for today. We really want to spend the time today, like I said, getting to know you and um, sharing a bit about our toddler program and especially in um, sharing with you some resources and actually some some uh, some work for you to start start doing before we see you in the fall. We're going to be uh, going over three main, I guess, um, components of the program. The adult. I think everybody was sent the video about the role of the adult, the Montessori guide uh, to to review the guide, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The child certainly the most important person that right now that we're talking about. At no other time in a child's life, except during adolescence, is the child growing as fast as they are right now. And you all probably see that day to day with your toddlers, that one day to the next can be very, very different. They are growing so fast. So we're gonna talk about that growth. We're gonna talk about the developmental needs of the child. And uh, <clears throat> then we're gonna talk about how to best prepare your environments at home, a little bit about that, but how we prepare the environments in the classroom to meet these changing needs of the toddler. Um, talk a little bit about independence, and then we're gonna get to uh, how we're, we're, the plans we have to support you and to offer resources and uh, a way to communicate uh, from, from today on. So, so I would like to take a minute, though, to go through and have each one of our guides. I'm going to ask each one of the guides to just to spend a minute introducing yourselves and then um, let us know why toddlers. Why do you want to work with toddlers? So, Allie, do you want to start? Sure. I am um, Allie Alexander. 
I am going into, I believe, my seventh year with the toddlers at Green Spring. Um, before that, I taught at a different school for a couple years in Children's House. Um, and toddlers is just definitely the place for me. I, I think it's just, there's nothing else like the growth that we see at this young age in such a small amount of time. We wish we could hold on to them longer than we do. And um, there's nothing better than seeing them continue on at Greenspring as they grow through Children's House and even into elementary. But, yeah. Thanks, Ellie. Allison, how about you? Hi, I'm Allison Kevin. I am a young toddler guide. Um, this will be my sixth year of teaching um, and my going into my fourth year at Greenspring. Um, like Allie said, I just love to be able to be a part of the toddler's rapid growth and development. It's such a special time in their life where they're just constantly picking up new things and um, just seeing what they're truly capable of and the excitement they feel with um, just every learning opportunity. Um, I just love them. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. <laughs> yes. um, how about, uh, Kim, how about you? I am Kim McCaslin. I'm going into my fifth year at Greenspring. I am currently the uh, dual language toddler guide for the older toddlers. Um, and I have been working with toddlers for 15 years now, so it's been a while. <laughs> um, I love toddlers, honestly, for the same reason. There's no other age group that you're going to, in the beginning of the year, potentially see a child that is a little sad about leaving their parents, not really speaking very much. And then at the end of the year, all of a sudden, they're bursting and ready to go into school. They're happy to be there. They're greeting their classmates and speaking full sentences. I feel like no other age group are you going to get that kind of span. And they're adorable. <laughs> I yep. love working with them. They're my favorite age group. <laughs> uh, Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Callahan. Uh, this is, I think, around my 17th year of toddlers. I've been at Green Spring for 33 years now. Uh, doing toddlers, doing admin, a bunch of other things. Uh, toddlers, to me, are the kids. Everybody kind of writes off. Everybody looks at the elementary exactly. and older as being, you know, so Kate, the toddlers, the toddlers don't often get the credit they deserve. Crazy, but thank you. Thank all you so much. They, all of the, the development that they have in such a short period of time. So. Exactly. Like, how does that? Um, how about Michelle? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Danusha, oh. we'll do you next, Danusha. Okay. okay. <laughs> so who? Me? Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Danusha Wilson. Um, I am the older toddler guide. Um, I've been working with toddlers. I'm going into my 13th year, but this is my seventh year at Green Spring. Um, I, you know, I, I love the toddlers. My children are grown and don't need me. Um, so I was telling the, the families in my breakout room that they, it's like a, an extension of my family when we become um, our community in our classroom. Um, I just, to watch them grow because they change so much month to month and week to week. And it's, it's amazing where they start and then to see at the end of the year where, how far they've come. It's incredible. It's an incredible process to watch because they're so capable of so much. And I just think us as a society really underestimate what they are so capable of doing. So I just really, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. And Michelle. Yes. Hello. I'm Michelle. I, um, I work with the older toddlers. Uh, this will be my 20th year um, going, working with the toddler community. I, um, I also agree with everyone. I, I think it's, it's just a great age to see where they start in September and all the big work that they do and the excitement that they portray and, and I get to be a part of it. Like, I think that's just so cool to watch them grow and by spring, they're just, they're, their confidence is high. They're, um, they're just little beings and um, it's great to watch. And I also enjoy being able to see them grow grow throughout the other levels at our school. I think that's a, a great thing too, like where our community is, like we're right near children's house. And so I, I, I know we only get them for a year and I, I, I miss not having them longer, but I also enjoy seeing them grow throughout the other levels. So it's fun. <laughs> Thank you. 
what a what a team. This is the team you want with your toddlers when they start uh, saying no, <laughs> because this team understands that that's actually a beautiful thing because that's the time that the child truly is um, showing us that they know that they have a choice in the world, you know? And so uh, this team has worked with toddlers for a long, long time. I don't know how much collected all together, how many years, but um, they, they are going to be your go-to resource when you're about, you know, when you're frustrated or confused or, or, or crying or need some help. This is your go-to team. You go next, Ellie. Great. So I'm going to start. Um, this is Beth. We are talking. We're looking right now at, on your screen is the Montessori triad. Um, that triad looks at the dynamic relationship between the child the adult and the environment. Um, they call us guides. So when I slip into that word, you'll know where it comes from. Um, the child comes in with a very specific set of skills and abilities, interests and learning styles. The guide, it's up to us to observe and recognize where the children are, assess where to meet their needs, what they need, how to get there, and then prepare the environment to, to work with the children, um, to, to engage them and meet their developmental needs. Um, the role of our toddler guide is very different. There are, you see a lot of different points on this. Let me pull my other screen down. Um, first off, nurture and connect with the children. We are often the first out of house, um, non-family caregiver that, that children get. So it's really up to us to develop a relationship, not just with the child, but with you to create a sense of trust and just a, a loving relationship with all of us um, to make this a very successful school experience. Um, we establish the community, um, encouraging and modeling participation as a member of the community because every child is a member and an active and engaged and real member of our community. They're, they're not just there as, as window dressing. They are our community. Um, we prepare the classroom environment. As I said, we really look at where the children are and how to get them through the progression of the curriculum. We plan lessons, not just on our shelf work, but through everyday experiences. Um, we have the flexibility of going off on tangents if you know something happens one day that really is a teaching experiment and a moment we can jump on that and give a lesson and provide an experience that's just kind of off the cuff but is it, they're ready for it and it, it they were calling for it we have the time that parents don't often have i know when my girls were little it was it's time we need to leave the house now and your shoes aren't on, your coat is on, it is on the hook. You don't have anything together and I need to get it for you. In school, we have that time. Okay, it is time for us to go outside. Well, the rest of the children can go out. I, I can sit with you and wait for you to get that on. So we have that moment that you don't necessarily have. Um, developing language. Everything in a toddler community is about language. We have stories and songs and conversation and lessons with materials, but everything kind of centers around language in our classrooms. Um, moving at the child's own pace, obviously, knowing where everybody is and not every child who turns two years old is going to hit those milestones at the exact time and date. So knowing where everybody is, is, is our job. Um, no need for praise. We don't want this to be about us. The children's activities are their job. And I don't want them to look at us for, for praise or for, um, I can't think of the word now. Okay. Uh, yeah, we do not want them to look at us and say, I did this so that you can praise me. We want it to be above a process over product and you'll often not get things home that you would in a, a typical daycare. You're not going to get the snowman pictures or the, the dot to dots. 
because a lot of our stuff, they, they, once they're done making that product, they're done and they don't need to take it home. It was all about the process of doing that work. So I think it goes next to, yep. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the toddler um, and how we meet the needs of the child at this plane of development. So to start just a few quotes, gotta be able to read them, sorry. <laughs> all that we are, all that we ourselves are has been made by the child. By the child we were in the first two years of our lives. It follows that at the beginning of his life, the individual can accomplish wonders without effort and quite unconsciously. So these quotations help frame the idea that we're not just entertaining or watching children entertain themselves. Our environment is one that is carefully prepared to meet the needs of the child during this monumental time of self-construction. Um, we remove obstacles to their development, which oftentimes includes us, the adult. So every day in our program, we're focusing on a lot, but three main things. Uh, language development, like Beth said, our Entire program is enriched with purposeful language. We know that these are the most formative years for language acquisition. We label everything in our classroom for the children. Everything we see, we label. Um, we know that the stories and the songs that we tell are gonna just help their sponge of a brain absorb the language. We have conversations with them all day long, which sometimes is just us having a conversation and um, getting a few bits and pieces back, maybe some acknowledgement that we're talking, but they really are a sponge at this stage. So they take in everything they hear and um, somewhere in those toddler years, usually we say around 2.5, we start to see what we refer to as this language explosion where everything that they have internalized is suddenly coming out verbally. Um, and it's really one of the most amazing things to witness for um, a parent and a guide who has just been talking to themselves to all of a sudden have a toddler talk back to them. Um, movement, obviously this is one of the biggest stages for movements, just small and large purposeful movements, how to simply physically navigate their surroundings, um, whether that be carrying a tray with a material on it from shelf to the table, how to walk up and down stairs or even a step, how to pick up a small object with their finger and thumb, anything you can think of movement-wise, they're working on that, how to um, walk on different surfaces, climbing, giving them just all the opportunities to get used to using all the different muscles in their body. And then one of the biggest things is independence, helping the child to do things for themselves. We, the adult, like I said, are often the obstacles in the way of witnessing how much the young child is truly capable of. Um, it's one of my favorite things about Montessori is just how we really trust the child to be able to do Th simple things like carry an open pitcher of water across the room, um, work with glass vases, um, cut up a banana for snack. Obviously the tools we use are safe, but they're not tools that you're gonna see in a typical daycare, even a preschool. Um, and everything we do really aims to develop four things, uh, order, coordination, concentration, and independence. So I just have one last little slide about the toddler and a simple quote, I can do it myself. And it's once you, you're gonna start hearing that a lot. <laughs> um, this is just a simple picture of showing one of our youngest toddlers doing something completely independently. So there, this is the what some people will refer to as the Montessori coat flip. So she's laid her jacket out by herself. She has flipped it over her head and she's got it on all by herself. And I believe this is an 18 month old. All right.
Miss Danusha, is this yours? Yes. So communication, um, we talk a lot about, which you've already heard, um, oral language is, is such a big part of what we do um, because they're just absorbing and we're providing them with so much uh, as far as rich language. Um, and, and they're in a sensitive period for language development as well when they come to us. And each child um, we find is they're all different as far as that range goes. Uh, we have children that come, they have, they can't say a word um, to the children who are pretty far along with being able to articulate what their wants and needs are. Um, but the beauty of our program and our environments is that we can meet the needs of all those children. Um, and it's, it's just, it really is a big part of what they do. Um, the children, you know, we provide them with, um, we, so that they can hear it throughout their day. Uh, we, rhythm of our language um, through songs, rhymes, poetry, uh, stories, and everyday conversations. Um, but not only is it just oral language, communication also is in other parts of, of what we do. Um, it's how we model ourselves um, as far as the words and expression and tone that we use. Um, but not only that, like every, they're little sponges. So how we communicate to them that's what they're taking in and using as their model and how to communicate for themselves. But it's also our attitude, our body language, our actions, and how we respond to their needs. Um, so on all this provides um, an atmosphere for them to develop trust in us. Um, so that communication, so when they feel valued and know that they're being listened to, um, that trust gets built and we start to build that relationship of trust and respect. Um, responsive communication is what helps develop that, that trust um, for whoever cares for your ch child. Um, also, you know, communication can show through how our prepared environments as well. Um, prepare, having a prepared environment communicates to the child that they have a space that's they're free to safely roam and explore. Um, the work that we put on the shelves is carefully prepared for them and it's an enticing um, purposeful work that uh, they're drawn to. And that also, that you know, helps to motivate the child as well as build their, you know, um, trigger their curiosity. So with all this, so communication is in everything that we do. Um, just speaking and listening to them with respect. We get down on their eye level, which is so important at that age. Um, and, you know, another one of the things that we do is um, we don't use baby talk. <laughs> so we try to, we use the real correct words for everything in the language that we um, expose them to. Um, and even, you know, right down to when we want to give a lesson, we invite them. We, it's not a command. We respectfully invite them to the lesson and, they're, and then they're given the choice. They can either say, yes, I would love to have a lesson or no, thank you. There's a lot of grace and courtesy that goes in our communication as well. So they're learning a lot. So it's not just about oral language, it's about everything else that we are providing for them in our program. Oh. Okay, I think this is me. <laughs> So in our environments, we provide activities to help children develop their fine and gross motor skills, along with opportunities for maximum effort. So when we make sure that each child develops the skills that they will need to gain a sense of order and independence in our classrooms. Um, we typically provide work that aids in developing their fine and gross motor muscles. So their fine muscles are the ones in their hand and their gross, the, you know, the pincer grass and the gross muscles are the bigger, the bigger work. Um, our children participate in practical life activities that improve their fine motor skills, which work with the small muscles in their hands, wrists, and fingers, at the same time practicing their hand-eye coordination. So if, I don't know if you've ever been to one of our environments before, but you can see work on some of our shelves like spooning beans and pouring water and transferring objects with tongs and tweezers. Uh, these activities develop a child's pincer grip, which is necessary for learning how to write. Um, other ways we encourage fine motor movement is by carrying a work mat, unrolling 
and rolling a rug and putting it on the floor and carrying work from a table to a table or to the floor. Uh, to develop the large muscles of the body, it's important for your child to reach their gross motor milestones. These are things such as walking and running and jumping and climbing. Uh, these actions also build their self-esteem. We do a circle time and sing lots of songs that have movements in them, uh, whether it be jumping or dancing or walking the line. We have some really fun songs that we provide for them. We also provide work that helps satisfy the child's need for maximum effort. So these materials allow the child to put forth all of their effort and strength into mastering a task. Um, as your toddler grows, you'll see that he will look for ways to develop his strength, uh, ways that he can challenge himself. So in our environments, we provide the children with heavy objects to lift and to drag and to carry. Uh, we have jugs filled with colored water and they can carry it across the room and find the matching color mat that they have. That's always a fun activity for them. Um, we have wheelbarrows in our outdoor spaces and pumpkin rolling. There's a picture of a, a little one rolling a pumpkin. Um, these are work that they can pick up and roll to a designated space. So our children help to prepare our community snack also. And not only are they preparing it, but they are setting the table for it. This includes moving the big tables and chairs, which can be often heavy. Um, so we can all gather together for a meal. Uh, these are all ways that we create movement and dependence within our spaces. And we do it outside also. We have a wonderful playground that they can play and they can climb up there and, and carry heavy things out on that space too. Uh, so grace and courtesy. I know like Danute, Ms. Danusha and, and Ali touched a little bit on some of the things I'm gonna go over. Um, but in a Montessori environment, you can see grace and courtesy in the classroom at every level. Uh, respect to each other, oneself, and the environment are valued within our community. Uh, children are naturally respectful of each other and, and are often helpful. Uh, they want to help each other. They want to help themselves. The role of the guide is to give lessons by modeling the peace and respect for each other. So something as simple as saying, bless you, when someone sneezes or excuse me as you walk by small spaces um, is another way to dis display this. You will often see other children bring a tissue to another child without being prompted to. Um, we have lots of runny noses in our environment. <laughs> so we're giving lots of lessons on that. Um, but even if a child is feeling sad or, or even may just need their nose wiped, um, other children recognize that. Showing empathy to one another and being able to comfort someone who may be sad are, are lessons that we model daily. Um, sometimes a child may be upset with one another. Uh, this happens often when learning how to share the materials and way to turn. I mean, often lots of these children come and they, they don't have a sibling or, or they're little. <laughs> and um, this is an environment where they have to learn to wait a turn. Um, sometimes their language has not been yet established, so it can be hard for a child to express themselves. So we are there to support them through this situation. Um, it's also important to acknowledge their feelings first and then give them the language to express themselves. So often, you know, if a little one is sad, we'll always say, oh, you seem sad, you know, what's going on? And then if, if there's an interaction between the two that they're upset with each other, we'll, we'll try to, to give them the language to talk to each other and explain how that made them feel. Often you'll hear a child say, that made me feel sad or that hurt, you know, so. We also show the children how to act in social situations. Uh, for example, when a visitor arrives, we have the child introduce themselves and usually shake their hands if, if they're comfortable with that. <laughs> um, here's a picture of a child that's waiting quietly for a turn with work. His hands are respectfully behind his back. Um, he's respecting the space around his friend while he concentrates. Uh, this skill also builds patience and how to share the work. So one thing you often see in our toddler rooms is an older child helping a, a younger child and it could be as simple as zipping up his jacket or helping put his slipper on. Um, a child might accidentally spill beans on the floor and two children will even stop what they're doing and come over and be so helpful in picking them all up. Uh, toddlers also love to sing songs so these are great moments when you can sing us 
a cleanup song together and they all enjoy that. So these acts of kindness will stay with them their whole life. Um, and as a guide, we are aware of how we interact with children. Treating the child with respect means that we, we speak to the children with soft voices, as Danusha had said earlier, and we get down to their eye level. Um, we give the children also the freedom to choose their work and decide wh when they wanna work and where they wanna work. Um, when it comes to the child learning how to care and respect for themselves, we are demonstrating daily lessons, such as blowing one's nose or washing their hands, um, getting out in and out of a chair as simple as that, or putting on their shoes and hanging up their jacket. The guide also models respect within our environment. So lessons on respecting the environment could include like setting our table for community snack or how to put their work back on the shelf, uh, washing and watering a plant, um, a table, even that simple, something as simple as cleaning a table. We all have animals in our environments. Most of us have fish. We've tried the gerbil or the guinea pigs and that lasted a little while, <laughs> but uh, they all take responsibility for it, for their pet. And it, it's a great way to, to show them how, how they have dependent upon them. Um, so these are, these are all great lessons that create gratitude for ourselves and our spaces and the world we live in. So purposeful activity, um, it is a very large part of our curriculum. We refer to a lot of these activities as practical life. Um, there are things that we as adults think of as chores. So things like loading the dishwasher and unloading it, folding laundry, watering plants. Michelle actually touched on a lot of it too, cleaning up spills. Um, all of these things that we as adults think of as chores and think of almost sometimes as a burden to do, young children love to do them. They have a very innate desire to be purposeful and to be a part of their community and a part of their environment. So while playing and free play is important, in our classrooms we focus more on the things that they can do to contribute and be strong members of the community. So some examples of what we do in the classroom um, during our snack time, we have a community snack and we have little bowls and little classes for each child. We'll have a child setting the table. Um, and then after we have our community snack, each child is responsible for putting their dishes into the dishwasher. Um, that's just one simple example of the many different activities that we do in our classroom that are very purposeful. Um, it helps develop concentration and an ability to follow a sequence. Some of our more advanced work are uh, cloth washing, for example, and dishwashing, which is by hand. We have a methodology for that, and it involves quite a lot of steps. It also involves a lot of water and a lot of spills, so they get to clean up the spills too, which is, <laughs> which is always a fun portion of it. Um, and the children love to do it. These are things that they gravitate towards, and by following a sequence, they're helping order their thinking. They're helping remember to do things. It's helping develop an ability to follow multiple step directions. Um, so these, these are very important aspects of our curriculum. Um, and the beauty of it is these are things that you can do with your toddler at home. Um, you can have them observing you when you're vacuuming the floor or sweeping or cleaning something up, feeding a pet, um, watering the plants, gardening. Uh, pretty much anything that you do around the house could be helpful. Um, and you can try to make it so that your child can participate with you. I think one of the main ways that can be a lot of fun for everyone is cooking. Um, there is something called a learning tower that is like a really tall step stool and it has a um, it's almost like a perch, like it has like a little shelf around it so they don't fall off. Um, that is very nice if you, if you like cooking with your child, even a step stool if they can reach the counters. We just try to think of ways to make things accessible. Um, and these are great skills to foster at home. Uh, one of the most arguably purposeful activities is toilet learning, which uh, Danusha is gonna talk about. So toileting, that is really, it's a big part of um, our, our day. Um, 
we have some children, a, a good portion of our children that come in diapers, um, a few that come in underwear, but it's, it's a, the beauty of our toilet, our toilet learning program is that it's built into um, our morning. Uh, when the children come in, um, they put their things away, they use the toilet, everything is their size in our classroom, so which is even better. Um, and everything, like the way we have our bathroom set up, they have access to all their things. So it's a process that they're also involved in. Um, one of the goals of the older toddlers is to be toilet learned by April to be ready for children's house. Now, that's not um, to say that you have to have your child in underwear by April and successful, because that's not always the case. We really go by a case by case basis. Um, but we do strive, that's just a goal. We strive to get um, as many as our, of our children in underwear in the older toddler program as we possibly can um, by, by the time spring comes around. But as far as like our, like I was saying, um, you know, they use the toilet, our bathrooms are um, accessible for them. So they are able to get diapers. Uh, we change our diapers with the children standing. Um, which is typically a new thing for all, for children when they come in. Um, but the purpose of that is that we want them as involved in the process as possible um, because it helps to build their independence um, and they feel a part of the process and they take that on because toilet learning really becomes their work and we're just there to guide them. Um, so they'll use the toilet and they're free to use the toilet whenever, but um, after they're in underwear, they eventually get to a point where they're just in and out on their own. Um, but we typically have them um, use the toilet at least twice in the morning. We use it when they first come in um, and then before they go outside. Unless of course they're, they're in a need of a change part of that, but um, that's typically how we have it built in, but we can change them whenever, like if another child has a bowel movement or is super wet, obviously we would change them um, before then. But um, it's, it's really, uh, it's a nice, program and um, we the fact that they see the other children using the toilet as well that that's also um, a good process because it's, it's like they're role models um, because you do have children that come in and have never really willingly sat on the toilet um, but you know some of the things we look for um, when they're ready to make the transition to underwear is they're staying dry all day um, they're able to independently get their pants up and down, um, as well as sitting on the toilet willingly, willingly and urinating. Um, and another thing too is, you know, when you ask a toddler if they want to go to the toilet, they're probably going to say no 98% of the time. Um, we have a very matter of fact attitude about it, like, oh, it's just time to go. And then we take them to the bathroom, you know, and we just, we keep it very casual. We don't apply the pressure to them. It's just, we really just make it a part of the natural process of their day. Like, oh, we've all got to go. It's time to go. So um, it, it's a great environment for them to really want to learn to do it themselves. Um, but um, we'll certainly, you know, at, in the program, we'll reach out to you when we see that your child is ready. Um, and that could be at any time because it's a partnership. Once they start, I, I, you know, once they go into underwear, we don't like to go backwards. So we want to make sure that they're always ready to take that next step because it is such a big work for them. All right. So the toddler environment. Um, the toddler environment is completely designed around the toddler and their growing needs. Um, the furniture is at their height. The shelves are all at their height. Um, we even have small toilets and sinks um, to make everything fully accessible to them. Um, we don't have anything in the, environment, in the environment that the toddler can't use because we want to encourage them um, to explore everything in their world. Um, so you, anything that's in our environment, um, the children have full access to explore at any time. Um, let's see. So the materials that we provide for the children um, are all supporting that growing independence. Um, we'll give them a lesson on a material and then from there the child has the opportunity to work with it for however long that they 
um, want to use it um, or go back to it and use it for however long that they want to use it because um, we really want them to work at their own pace um, without any pressure and um, giving them that time to independently um, learn new skills without us invading or intruding on that um, growing independence and in work. Um, we have the time to just kind of be patient and observe the child and let them um, take things at their own pace. Um, like Beth was talking about, when we go to the playground, some of the children will get their shoes on quickly, whereas others might need a little bit more time um, to work on that. So we're able to kind of just sit back and work with the child and kind of let them do things at their pace without interrupting them or pressuring them to get things done. Um, nope. <laughs> so the toddler um, wants to understand the world around them. Um, everything in our environment is a lesson. It can be as simple as how to take off your jacket, how to zip it up, how to hang it on a hook, how to unvelcro your shoes. Um, it's not necessarily a material off of the shelf. We take any opportunity um, to work with them and give them lessons on everyday activities. Um, if they make a mistake along the way, we're very graceful about it and just work with them on how, how do we fix it. So if water spills when they're working on pouring instead of, oh my goodness, water spilled, we remind them, all right, let's 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 get a towel, we'll clean it up and put it in the laundry. Um, it's very unpressured. So when a mistake happens, it happens and we learn from it. Um, we really try to engage the toddlers in everything that we're doing. Um, they really like to mimic the adults in their world. Um, so anything that we're working on, we try to include the children on. So if we're preparing snack for the day, um, the children have all toddler sized kitchen tools that they're able to participate with, um, prepare the snack for the day, or if we need to wash the linens for the classroom, um, the children will carry the laundry basket all the way to the washing machine um, and then come back with us to switch it to the dryer and bring it back and um, help us to fold in the classroom. So we're really engaging them with the world around them and all of those meaningful activities. Um, because they really want to be involved in those big purposeful um, lessons that help them feel that they're contributing to their community. We have, um, let's see if I can get this to work, created a little uh, checklist, a basic list that you all will be receiving in your summer packets. Um, hopefully you can see that on your screen. I don't know if it's a little small, but um, it's not to scare you. It's just um, a list uh, to jumpstart into the understanding of the level of independence that we find young and older toddlers to really be capable of. Um, I want to stress we're not expecting all of these skills to be mastered at the time of enrollment but um, a comfort level in attempting them is really gonna serve the child well. So um, feeding, we expect the children coming into our program to be able to feed themselves with some level of independence, That whether that looks like just taking bites of something independently. Um, we don't spoon feed the children. We don't cut up the food into teeny tiny pieces. Um, Everything is safe, obviously, and not a choking hazard. Um, and drinking, they, we expect that they're no longer drinking from a bottle and they're able to drink from a straw and or an open cup. We will start working with drinking from an open cup on day one. So um, we expect the dribbles and the spills and everything, but we give them a controlled amount of water. We give them a child-sized cup to drink from to make it um, child toddler friendly. The motor skills, the most important thing is for them to be able to walk independently, um, but also dressing and self care. This is some of our biggest work in the beginning of the year for sure. Uh, we hope to see the children attempting 
to help us with these skills when they enter our program. So at least pushing their arms through a shirt, attempting to push their foot into a shoe. Uh, we don't expect them to be able to dress themselves, but just to be really an active participant in the process. Um, communication, uh, again, doesn't, not expected to be clear, expressive verbal communication right off the bat, but an attempt to uh, be able to express their needs, however that looks, and as well as to follow a simple direction or a cue. And let's see, um, comfort and sleeping. For those of you that might have children that will be napping at school, we um, expect them to be able to have some level of self-soothing and ability to fall asleep with minimal support. Um, it's a room full of toddlers with one or two guides, so they just need to, we often help them get settled and get down for their nap, but to a limited extent. And then, so that was, those first things were kind of what we expect for incoming 18 month olds and above. For two and above, it includes everything that I just mentioned, but also independently uses a utensil to eat, especially a spoon. Uh, walks up and down stairs with one hand or holding somebody's hand, able and willing to push and pull their pants up and down, because just like Denisha talked about, toileting is the biggest part of our day. Um, remove their jacket or shirt and assist with putting their shirts and jackets on, um, putting their shoes on with assistance and using single words to communicate needs or to get attention. Well, let's see how to go back. All right, and then well, just a few resources to share with you guys. We have um, the first two books on here, The Montessori Toddler and Toilet Awareness, are books that we all have in our classrooms. So we um, lend them out as a lending library to, for you all to um, have a chance to look through them. The Montessori Toddler is a pretty in-depth um, book that's just, it's got lots of pictures, so it's a wonderful read. The Toilet Awareness book is pretty short and quick, and it's something that we often hand, give to our parents when the child is approaching their readiness for toilet learning. And then two websites, the Montessori Notebook, but the one of the biggest ones I want to bring your attention to is Aid to Life. If you have not checked out that website before, I strongly encourage just poking around. Um, There's some wonderful videos to watch that will just show you some of the um, abilities that these little guys have. And this is a big one. Um, what's next? This is we're in the middle of, actually, I guess we're closer to the end of May right now. We have several months laid out in front of us before school starts. So we are gonna have plenty of contact with you guys um, just to, to be there, to be a resource, but also to bring you into the community. So the first thing I guess is going to be coming out in June and then another in July will be the newsletters. Lots of helpful information. There'll be a, a philosophy piece in each. I know one of the philosophy pieces will be about separation, talking about the whole process and how we work through it and just as a, another resource for you guys. Next will be Google Classroom. Right now we have them set up for our individual classrooms for this current school year. We're gonna set one Google Classroom up for all the incoming families and there will be all kinds of, of um, materials and resources there for you. All the newsletters will be there. Pretty much everything will be included in that, um, including the supply list. Uh, the summer packets come out in July, which will include placement and again, the supply lists and some other information. Come August, you will be getting a call from your guide just to introduce you and answer questions, talk about what's coming up ahead um, and just to, to get to know your child a little bit. Um, then we will have a getting ready for green spring kind of um, this sort of thing, but more pertinent logistical information that'll be held in late August, right before classes start. 
Um, after that, we go to the classroom visits where, I mean, and then this is all assuming that, that fall is looking like it regularly does. You'll have the classroom visit where you'll bring your child in for 15, 20 minutes, see the classroom, meet the guide, meet the assistants, get a little acclimated so that once school starts, it's not going to be someplace that the child's never seen before. They'll have a little familiarity with it. We have a toddler picnic the week before school starts in August, early September. Um, usually we try to schedule those visits right around that time. It gives us a few days to get our classroom set up, come in for the visit, come in for the picnic. The picnic allows you to meet the other families who are around in the classroom and, and in the toddler program in general, plus the other guides and assistants. We are a pretty tight knit group of, of a team. So we kind of rely on each other, even outside on the playground. We'll know most of the children in the pro program, not just our own. Um, back to school night happens in early September. And that for the rest of the school, it will be what our getting into green spring thing is about. For us, we'll probably do a, a specific topic. Perhaps toileting has been bandied about. We might do that as a topic, but for the first half of the evening, the second half of the evening, the school usually gets together with all the parents, all the guides, the admin, and has a quick meeting and then kind of a, a meet and greet with, with all of them, a mixer, if you'll say. Then we have Throughout the school year, we have coffee and conversations that are run by the admin team. There are some times that we will come in and talk about topics as well, uh, parent educa education kind of stuff. We have monthly newsletters that are put out by classroom that uh, talk about some of the particulars of what's going on, what's upcoming, what's going on in the classroom. Um, but also we have philosophy pieces and often uh, lessons that get embedded in those, those newsletters as well. We do conferences and reports three times a year to, that we get a chance to really sit down and, and talk to you. Please don't think that that's the only contact we're gonna have face-to-face -face or um, even over the phone or email, we are always available whenever you guys need us for a question, a concern, a shoulder to cry on, a, you know, an ear to listen, we are here for you guys. There are also opportunities to visit the classroom through the school year. Parties usually revolving around holidays or um, in these like January, the second half of the year, once everybody is kind of in and, and separated and comfortable in the classroom, we invite you to come in for a morning and spend the morning with your child in the classroom showing uh, the, your work and or them showing you their work. Um, and a visitation like that. And then there are volunteer opportunities throughout the school as far as uh, like grounds day or going out so that you can actually um, go with some older children and, and do a like a, a mini field trip with some older children. So we try to get you involved in the community, not just in our level, but as the community as a whole. Um, and I think that's pretty much it, there is also, like Allie mentioned, that Aid to Life is a great resource that will give you lessons and philosophy and all kinds of, of things to look at for the next couple weeks before we really get into the, the uh, nuts and bolts of what's coming. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot, right? <laughs> An awful lot. We're going to be sending you things so you don't have to remember all of this yourself. There's a lot of information that you've been, we've been sharing with you today. So we'll be uh, sending follow-up, um, you know, newsletters to you to keep you abreast of all the resources that were included in this, um, in this session today. We did want to take a minute, though, or two or three or five or ten, however long it takes, to, to address some of the questions that you shared when you signed up for this, and also to just have a time to um, you know, address any new questions you might have. I'm gonna talk about a few of the things that came in beforehand. Most of them were about what's the fall going to look like. Um, and I think I, as best I could uh, ad address that for you. There were some questions about separation, and, and that's a really, really great topic, especially because the situation right now for everybody is so very different, that your children are not 
having um, the opportunities they may have had in that experience of being s separated from you. Uh, so I don't know, Allie, if you want to address that a little bit. Sure. Um, we actually just were talking about the fact that everything that we prepare to talk about and help parents get ready for having their child separate is almost impossible right now. We're expecting separation to be something across the board of all ages to be a really big part of the start of the school year. Um, because like, oh, like all, most of us, our children have only been with us. Um, we often recommend you try to, if you haven't already, have your child be left for short amounts of times with other adults. Obviously, that's really hard to do right now. Um, so I talked a little bit in one of my breakout sessions of, in the breakout session in the beginning about like a phase in schedule that we often do for some of our youngest children that have never left the home before and are just having a really hard time settling in. We'll just be in constantly in touch with you during the day, but sometimes it helps them to shorten their mornings for a few days in the beginning of the year. So we often expect the child in the beginning to show, get, have a few tears and sometimes the tears last for five minutes and we'll be able to send you a picture and say they are doing wonderfully. It was just enough to make you feel horrible. <laughs> I, I know the feeling. Um, but then we will have a child who just can't settle down and we're not going to let them cry for an expended extended period of times so we're going to give you a call and say i think they could use a shorter mor morning for today tomorrow just to get used to this new experience and to know that you're coming back at the end of the day and they can't tell time but they we have such strict routines that they start to be able to rely on the routines of the day to know what's coming next um i think I, it's hard because, like I said, a lot of our suggestions just really aren't feasible right now with the current state of the world. But if things loosen up and get better, the more exposure you can have, give your child to somebody other than you will help with the process. We do a meet and greet in the beginning of the year, assuming we're back on campus normally, where the parent brings the child into the classroom and meets with the guide, just the child, just the parent, just the guide and assistance for a, a short period of time. So the child can see their environment with the comfort of you by their side, because once school starts, we don't have the parents come into the classroom. So this is kind of a nice transition period for that. Does somebody, um, one of the guys, do you wanna talk just briefly about that, about not having parents in the classroom and what that looks like? Just Anybody? Sure. Uh, yeah. Having a classroom of their own, we really protect that space for them. That is, it, everything is their size. They know the routines. Um, often, if adults come into the classroom, it's very disruptive for the children because there's there's a rhythm and flow of our classrooms that the parents, because they're not there, don't know. So it, it often becomes disruptive for the kids or so outside of their, their normal routine that it really throws everybody through a loop. So we really do protect that classroom space for the children. When you're dropping off, um, I mean, we, I had a child in my class this year whose mom really wanted to walk her in every day and I would stop her at the door every day and, and take the child and let the child come in and, and but really kind of, not barred it off, but but set a boundary for the parent so that when she came into the classroom, that was her space and and mom respected it and the little girl had a, a fine time with it. Um, but mm -hmm. it is their space. We also find too, just quickly, that when we are taking or or um, getting helping the child get out of the car in the morning, that your child is leaving you at that point, and there's a big difference in that separation than there is from you taking the child to the classroom and then you leave them. So it's a, it's a very, it sounds subtle, but it's a big difference for the child. Um, 
So anyway, it's all about routines, like Ali said. It's all about that predictability and keeping to the routine and keeping to the schedule that really is most helpful. Um, I did want to, uh, I see that I'm looking at another screen here, a question about virtual possibilities. You know, what happens? I mean, we, like I said in the beginning here, we fully are looking to be fully on, you know, on campus in the fall. That is our hope. That's our wish. That's what we're, we're expecting to be and uh, getting ourselves going. There is, there is absolutely the possibility that we may find ourselves, depending on where we are in the world, having to go back to a um, quarantine situation. We don't want to lose our connection with anybody. We don't want to lose our connection with the children who have, have just you know, been at the campus and, and met their guides and assistants and their classmates. Um, and so we are absolutely looking into ways to make sure that that connection stays um, open and, and uh, vibrant for us. It, it is not going to be an online program for toddlers. It's just not, um, doesn't really work that well. It works well to connect and sing a song maybe and say hello and see each other. But as far as really uh, any delivering any real curriculum, what we do in the classrooms just can't be duplicated online for young children. And so we're hoping we never have to get back to this point where we all are right now. Um, but if it does happen that we find ourselves, you know, having to stay home, um, you know, for whatever period it is, that that's, you know, we're looking for ways to make sure that we can keep those connections uh, strong. And I, Shani, did you want to talk any more about that? I'm sure. Yeah, just from a... Um you know, a tuition perspective as well, we, our tuition would be adjusted to reflect, you know, that we're not able to provide the care that we would be if we were on campus. So know that heading in. We don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, we're working that out. You're going to be receiving um, uh, emails from us in our new family newsletters that'll continue, that'll have a survey to begin to kind of gauge um, your, you know, where you are right now. Do you want to just go half day if you are scheduled for a full day? Are you even wanting to return to campus immediately? You know, as soon as we, not immediately, but as soon as we can get back on. It's important that we begin to sort of gauge what everybody's, you know, what, how everyone's feeling about being on campus. And then we're gonna, um, you know, we, we are absolutely, like Betsy said, um, full on making plans to be on campus. It's not gonna look the same. It's not going to be the same numbers allowed. You know, there's all sorts of restrictions as to everything. <laughs> you know, it's a, going to be a different world. Um, but we are looking to 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 provide a place for all of our toddlers to be on campus. And like Betsy said, if we have if we end up having to go remotely again, we are not going to um, you know hold you to that tuition and and run an online toddler program. There's another question about supplies. What supplies do you need? The supply list, which I imagine may change <laughs> depending on what, what requirements there are or guidelines in, in place, we will be sending that supply list to you in the summer mailing. So you'll have plenty of time to, to look at that. And we'll also make sure to include that in our Google Classroom for new parents uh, so that you can access it there. And even we can give some recommendations about like where to find the, the ultimate slippers and um, different different things like that. So that will be a part of that communication for you. Um, what else? What else is on your minds right now? Anybody? What are you thinking? <laughs> no? We still have so many months ahead of us. Yes, go ahead. Yes. This is very insignificant, but <laughs> I have been wondering. I um, my son is signed up just for half day right now, and <laughs> I know this might sound silly, but I really love the idea of him of how the children are able to help set the table and prepare for the um, meal and that community time. So uh, <laughs> this might just be for me. But when does that like if it's a half day program for my son? Um, does that happen after, in the second half of the day or will that will he still be a part of that? Right, that's a great question because the truth is in the in the morning work cycle we have what we call the beautiful, well it's a snack, so snack time. 
is actually when the children are setting the table. I mean, they do at lunch too, but there's definitely that time for a gathering as a community around a meal. It may look different <laughs> depending on the guidelines, um, but there's definitely that time to gather because it's so important. We want them to be a part of that. So even our students who are just half day have that opportunity to set the table, to prepare the snack, to sit down and enjoy a, a meal together. Absolutely, great question. I would also add that the main part of that setting the table and preparing is really done in the morning for snack time because we do it for lunch, but oftentimes lunch can be a time when the toddlers start having meltdowns. So they will have them come in, some will come inside from the playground earlier than others. They'll stagger when they actually sit down for lunch. So the big community meal that we talk about is really our snack time at like 10 o'clock in the morning. Great. Yeah, go ahead, Angela. You're, you're, How, there you go. Okay. Um, my, kid, my son will be in the, um, the dual language. And so my question is how much Spanish, he's bilingual, so how much Spanish is actually being spoken and are there usually any other kids who are already bilingual in the classes? Mm -hmm. So that depends on the year. Um, there typically are at least one or two that are bilingual, but it kind of depends on who's enrolled at the time. Um, there is always a Spanish speaking assistant. So if your son is fluent in Spanish, he will be spoken to in Spanish. I do not speak Spanish. I speak, I guess, toddler Spanish. I know key words in Spanish <laughs> and key phrases. So I will use them, but I definitely speak English in the classroom. So your son will have both languages languages being spoken. And if he's already fluent, the, the assistant will be speaking in Spanish to him. Okay. I do want to just chime in, Angela, just in the spirit of full transparency. One of the things we're struggling with is in our efforts to get as many children on campus as we can, our numbers are being drastically reduced. And so what we're looking at, depending on who wants to join us on campus and who doesn't, um, potentially needing to dismantle the older toddler program for this for the for our you know older our dual language older toddler classroom to be able to get the toddlers on campus so this is preliminary we don't know um, exactly the way it's going to you know work out mm -hmm. uh, but for example you know if if um, some number of in in the older toddler classroom choose not to come on campus you know, in order to, it's like a big Tetris game, right? Yeah. In order to be able to, to fit everyone on, we might need to do some different things. So the older toddler pro dual language program is one of those pieces that it's a little early to tell right now if we're going to be even able to offer that in the new, in our new world. So just in the spirit of transparency, and we'll certainly be in touch with you all about that. Right, and, and it may, just to add to that, it, it may not look exactly like it has in the past, but we certainly have quite a few staff um, who, who are Spanish, uh, fluent Spanish speakers. So, and then we do have uh, uh, Marcella, who is our Spanish enrichment guide, who visits the classroom. So there will be exposure and there will be opportunity to um, converse in Spanish, no doubt about that. It just may not look exactly like it does this year. What else? Yes, Adam. Hi, uh, I was hoping that some of the guys could speak on their take on sign language. Uh, Grayson's currently trying to use more words, but he's still struggling, and he's, his sign language isn't great, but uh, I was wondering if they could speak on whether or not that's something we should be pushing forward with, or if we should be kind of relying more on the oral words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it his own language that he's creating right now? It's pretty close to sign language. Um, yeah, we introduced him pretty early on to like food and milk and all of those things, and he's okay. really stuck with that as opposed to his fine motor skills doesn't have like aren't as uh, adept to yeah, do the actual symbol close, signals. Though. But they're, he's close. So when when you when you signal with him, are you also accompanying that with the word? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he so knows part, both, but when yeah. he's trying to communicate with us. He yeah. will use the sign language over the word. Right. Okay. But if we use the word, he knows what we're saying. And he'll, like if we say okay. food, he'll know. He'll... Okay. Does anybody want to talk about that? 
Anybody um, in Virginia? I would say um, we definitely know the basics of sign language for a toddler's communication. And I always have parents come in in the beginning of the year and telling me a few signs to expect from their children. Um, I, I not, wouldn't say to deter him from it. Keep, it's a wonderful skill to have. We will definitely be constantly giving him the words and the language if we're signing along with him. Or if he, if he goes like this to us, we'll, we'll say, oh, you would like more please and just give him the language. Um, and then as the year progresses, as he gets a little older, we start requesting it a little more. Can I hear you say more? Or um, I can't remember what water is, but I had a little girl this year who just wouldn't say water and not just say water. <laughs> Can I hear water? Um, or, but, or really, we don't demand that from them, but every single time I would give her water, I would say, you would like some more water. Here's your water. And it's just repeating the words over and over again. Um, there's been wonderful studies about the use of sign language in the beginning. So it's definitely a strong skill to have. And I think the, like we said, the vocabulary, the language is going to come um, soon and quickly with the sign language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just important that that's why I asked if he's created his own language because some, sometimes toddlers do. It's just important that we know the same signs <laughs> that, that he's using, right? Thank you. Question. Anyone else? Anything else? No? Okay, great. If something occurs to you, if after we finish here and you think, oh, I forgot to ask that, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me, to Shaney, to, to any of us. Um, this is the start. Here we are. This is the start of what we hope will be a very, very long and beautiful uh, partnership. As you, as you enter the Green Spring community. And um, we can't wait. We can't wait to be on campus together. We can't wait to meet your children uh, and to be working with them and, and moving forward. So um, look, look out in your emails for, for an invitation come June or on mid-June uh, for the Google Classroom. And that'll be a wealth of information that's also going to provide for you a chance to ask questions, um, you know, share concerns, anything like, I'm trying this and it's not working, you know, maybe each other, you can support each other in, 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 um, in your journey and as you're helping your child learn how to drink from a cup <laughs> or, or anything else um, that's ahead. So I do want to just quickly share, um, just this is a small group here, but I do want to share that our toddler community coming in this fall is about 70 strong. So there's a lot of toddlers joining us. It's not just you five or six. <laughs> you know, so, so I just wanted you to have that um, perspective. Um, we, we are, we are looking to have, um, several full classrooms and we'll see you know what that looks like of course as we head in but it's a it's a very full community full of wonderful families and children and we're very excited to have you on campus yep and you're you're now the veteran toddler parents so now you've had this session right <laughs> <laughs> so you'll you'll be able to help the other other parents and families know just what's what with our with our program so thank you all so very much um like i said we can't wait to see you and um we'll be in touch soon Okay. Thank you for coming. Right. Thank you.